Hello everyone and welcome to the Web Book of Bookworm. My name is Elizabeth and today I'll be continuing with another book by J.K. Chesterton, namely Orthodoxy. The book was published in 1908 and it has become a classic of Christian apologetics. Before I summarize and review the book, let's start with a brief introduction to the author. J.K. Chesterton was an English writer, philosopher, Christian apologist and a literally an art critic. When he wrote this book, he was still Anglican, and his conversion to Catholicism happened 14 years later. In the book Orthodoxy, he describes his personal journey to Christianity, although I'd like to add that the book doesn't feel or sound like a diary, but rather like an abstract book on apologetics. I'll summarize the most interesting ideas from the book now, but please note that this is not a summary of the whole book, but I rather just picked certain ideas from the book that are not connected in any way, and that also don't represent the book as a whole. Let's start with Chesterton's thoughts on miracles, or rather on the question if they exist. He writes that the question of whether miracles really happen is all about using our common sense and imagination to understand history, and not about conducing physical experiments. An example he gives here is that if we wonder whether ghosts can communicate with the living, it's silly to expect it to happen in unrealistic circumstances where even normal people, so people that are alive, wouldn't communicate. He makes the comparison that the fact that ghosts prefer darkness doesn't disprove their existence, just like lovers preferring darkness doesn't disprove love. If someone insists on a complicated test under weird conditions to believe something, it's unlikely to happen, and they won't get the truth, as Chesterton argues. Quote, if you choose to say, I will believe that Miss Brown called her fiancé a periwinkle or any other endearing term, if she will repeat the word before 17 psychologists, then I shall reply, very well, if those are your conditions, you will never get the truth, for she certainly will not say it. He argues that it's not scientific or sensible to be surprised that certain unusual connections don't happen in unfriendly environments. Chesterton explains that this is like saying you can't see fog because the air isn't clear enough or needing perfect sunlight to watch a solar eclipse. What I also found interesting was what Chesterton wrote on the topic of suicide versus murder and on the question whether committing suicide and becoming a martyr are basically the same. The author argues that suicide is the ultimate evil, as it can be defined as refusing to take interest in existence. This definition is not revolutionary or anything, but I just found it interesting how he phrased those things. In his own words, The man who kills a man kills a man. The man who kills himself kills all men. As far as he's concerned, he wipes out the world. His act is worse, symbolically considered, than any rape or dynamite outrage, for it destroys all buildings, it insults all women. The thief is satisfied with diamonds, but the suicide is not. That is the crime. He cannot be bribed, even by the blazzling stones of the celestial city. The thief compliments the things he steals, if not the owner of them. But the suicide insults everything on earth by not stealing it. The man's crime is different from any other crime, for it makes even crimes impossible. After that, he discusses the question whether suicide is the same as martyrdom, and here he arrives at the conclusion that suicide is the opposite of martyrdom because, quote, a martyr is a man who cares so much for something outside of him that he forgets his own personal life. A suicide is a man who cares so little for anything outside him that he wants to see the last of everything. One wants something to begin, the other wants everything to end. Chesterton explains that martyrdom is noble because the martyr dies so that something else may live, while someone who commits suicide destroys the entire universe, spiritually speaking. Chesterton points out that Christianity offers good explanations to ethical questions as it always finds the right balance. For example, he considers modesty and finding the right balance between being too proud and feeling unworthy. The typical pagan or agnostic would say that they are happy with themselves, but not arrogantly so. They recognize there are both better and worse people than them, and they have their limitations, but they still value what they deserve. In simple terms, they would walk confidently without being snobbish or looking down on others. Christianity separated the two ideas, then exaggerated them both. In one way, man has to be haughtier than he has ever been before. In another way, he was to be humbler than he had ever been before. For example, on one hand, Christians believe that the Son of God died to save them, and on the other hand, they believe that without God they are nothing. Another example he presents is the complex idea of charity. He defines charity as either forgiving unforgivable acts or loving people who are hard to love. A sensible non-religious person might say that there are some people they could forgive and others they couldn't. 
For example, they might laugh off a slave who stole wine, but feel justified in punishing and cursing a slave who betrayed their benefactor. This kind of thinking is rational and makes sense, but it's not the whole story. It doesn't leave room for a simple compassion for all human beings, which is the essence of charity, as Chesterton argues. Chesterton explains that this is where Christianity comes in again, making a striking distinction. It separates the crime from the criminal. Christians are taught to forgive the criminal repeatedly, but not to forgive the crime itself at all. It's not enough to have mixed feelings of anger and kindness toward thieves. Instead, they should be much angrier at theft itself, while also being much kinder to the thieves. Just like in his book The Everlasting Man, Chesterton dedicated a portion of this book to the topic of similarities between religions. According to him, there are two types of alleged similarities. Resemblances that mean nothing because they are common to all humanity, and resemblances which are not resemblances at all. He quotes the author of a book that dealt with that topic, and Chesterton explains that an example of similarities that are common to all humanity is that both Christ and Buddha were said to have received messages from the divine that seemed to come from the sky, as if you would expect the divine voice to come from an ordinary place like a coal cellar. Another example he brought up was that suggesting that these two Eastern teachers coincidentally both had something to do with washing feet. But that's like saying it's remarkable that they both had feet to wash. The other supposed similarities were not really similar at all, as Chesterton argues. For instance, the argument was made that during certain religious events, the Lama's robe is torn into pieces as a sign of respect, and the remnants are highly valued. However, this is the opposite of what happened to Christ's garments, which were torn in mockery, and the remnants were only worth something to rag shops. Chesterton compares this to trying to find a connection between two ceremonies involving a sword, when it taps a man's shoulder and when it cuts off his head. They are not at all similar experiences for the man involved. He continues by saying that the fact that Buddhism is supporting kindness and self-control doesn't mean it's particularly similar to Christianity. It just means that it's, quote, not utterly unlike all human experience. Chesterton argues that Buddhists, like most people, oppose cruelty and excess in theory because it's a sensible thing to do. However, claiming that Buddhism and Christianity offer the same philosophy on these matters is simply untrue. Everyone agrees that we're entangled in wrongdoing, and many believe there's a way to break free. But when it comes to what that way is, Buddhism and Christianity couldn't be more different and contradictory, the author explains. Let's get to my opinion on the book. I would rate this book a 9 out of 10, so I liked it more than The Everlasting Man, because that book I rated an 8 out of 10 back then. And the reason why I liked Orthodoxy more is because I just found the thoughts more interesting and helpful. And here again, just as I said in The Everlasting Man, this book reads a lot like a collection of shower thoughts about Christianity, so many really creative things. And the reason why the rating isn't higher is, again, because some of those thoughts might simply be wrong. So, for example, Chesterton suggests that there are things that are logical necessities, and then there are things that are not logical necessities, but we treat them as such. So he says the fact that the Cinderella's older sisters were older than Cinderella and she was younger than them is a logical necessity, and we can't imagine anything else. But the fact that trees grow apples is not a logical necessity because we can also imagine trees growing guitars. And I'm not sure about the point he was trying to make here, and I'm also not sure how valid his reasoning is, because maybe we just know more about how uh, being a sister functions than how growing apples functions, and that's why we can imagine one thing and not the other. So that's something that I didn't like that much about the book. But it's definitely a refreshing thing to read if you have that many shower thoughts in there. But one thing that I did like about the book, for example, was that he wrote respectful things about women. For example, in the last chapter, he highlights the importance of mothers when it comes to educating children. So that's something I liked about the book. So in total, it's a 9 out of 10. That's been it for today. I hope you liked the video. See you next week. God bless and bye!